speaker this morning, with his usual wit and charm, is here to share with us another message that's insightful and inspiring and which will help guide us on our spiritual path. Friends, please help me welcome our pastor, our own spiritual leader, our beloved Reverend John Scott to the podium. Thank you, John. Good morning, family. Good morning, Reverend John. Let us affirm together, I believe, I have faith, I trust. Together, I believe, I have faith, I trust. A joy to add my own words of welcome, and I believe, I have faith, and I trust that this is truly the day that God has made, and we can rejoice together as a family and be glad to live in it and to share in it this morning's spiritual experience. I see some familiar faces, well, all the faces are familiar, some that are with us after a long absence. Welcome, welcome home, and those visiting from abroad. Uh, welcome as well, and welcome to those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Child Month, isn't it? I, I've, I've titled my encouragement today, as I call my Sunday messages, Becoming as a Little Child. Do all of you remember the, the laughing yoga um, applause? Some of you may. It's done by putting your hands, clapping your hands, like this, making sure your fingers are all aligned. And you do it three times. You go, very good, very good, very good. And then you throw your hands in the air with gay abandon and say, yay, like a little child. So let's try it three times. Very good, very good, very good, yay. Very good, very good, very good, yay. One more time. Very good, very good. Very good, yay! And only Maestro um, <laughs> Curtis Watson can do it in bass. Very good, very good, very good. And there is his wonderful wife, Pauline Curtis uh, 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 Forrest Watson, saying, yay! In soprano. Very good, very good, very good, yay. I'm going to make their seats one Sunday so you can hear them. It's wonderful. I never cease to be blown away by the wit and wisdom and honesty and humor of kids. So take this story about little Johnny. Little Johnny says to his grandmother, Grandma, how old are you? And Grandma says, oh, I'm 43 and, and holding. And little Johnny thinks for a moment and says, Grandma, how old would you be if you let go? <laughs> Today is Rhonda Lumsden Lou's birthday. Happy birthday, Rhonda. How old would you be if you let go? <laughs> That's a well-kept secret. But really, children can do that, can't they? They express their wishes, their needs, their anger, their hurt, their pain. They laugh and they cry, and then they just let go. They don't hold on to it. When it comes to faith, to trusting life, they have us beaten hands down, don't they? They just simply know how to do it, and they trust from a deep, deep sense of knowing that life supports them. We could really learn a lesson or two from our children. And so, right up here at the very beginning of my encouragement, I want to give you your assignment. I want you today to think about and to journal Lessons that you have learned from your children or from other people's children. Lessons I have learned from little ones out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. You'll be amazed if you think, think through that, all the wonderful, wonderful, the treasure of learnings that you have acquired over the years. Uh, and we don't, think, we don't think about it very often, do we? But the children are here really to teach us valuable and important lessons. Joan Borisenko, who has a marvelous little book titled Seven Paths to God, points to a penetrating study by Harvard theologian James Fowler, Dr. James Fowler, on how we develop faith and of the relationship of, our, of faith to our psychological development. According to this eminent researcher, studies show that we actually invent God 
in our own image. Or to be more precise, we invent God in the image of our parents and early caregivers. Now this is, this is a serious thing to, to ponder because if we had abusive, neglectful, or unreliable, or critical parents, we are likely to grow up with the low self-esteem and a concept of God as being a punitive, uh, let us say, judgmental, whimsical, sometimes, as we say in Jamaica, punishing God. And if we grew up with, with parents who were supportive and nurturing and who validated our, our beingness and our, our growth, we are likely to have a concept of a God that is, is loving and beautiful and supportive. So if you think back to your own early childhood development, you may find clues as to your own concepts of God and the development of your own faith, your own psycho-spiritual growth. According to Dr. Fowler, there are six stages through, through our lifetime. Um, the first stage is before the age of seven, up to the age of seven. Uh, in this first stage, little children live, as we know, in an imaginative world populated by angels and fairies, demons and monsters. In addition, children before the age of seven imitate the people around them and assume their beliefs. Think of the implications of this. If a child lives in a frightening household or is exposed to the traditional concepts of a fire and brimstone god, those early images become deeply ingrained in their psyche and can create a fear-based faith which keeps them living in fear of the wrath of God. And when I, I read this, I began to understand why so many Jamaicans living in a tropical country are terrified of lizards. Because we learned that fear from the people who were our caregivers. So, you know, I had a nanny and she would run screaming from the house for a poly lizard. All you know what a poly lizard looks like? It's a little thing about an inch long, speckled and beautiful. And she was so terrified she couldn't function. So, you know, my mother used to say, I hope to God the house isn't on fire and you find a, a poly lizard outside because you're going to stay in the house. Between seven and puberty, children go through a second stage of psychological development in which they tend to see things in black and white. Things are good and evil, fair and unfair. And in this stage, stories and myths told to them are interpreted literally. And the child demands reciprocity. You would hear them say, it's not, it's not fair. If he'd had that done, why didn't I have the same thing? Their faith during this stage rests in the concept of fairness, a concept of reward and punishment in which God is really a bit like Santa Claus, rewarding you when you are good and withholding the goodies if you are bad. At puberty, Young people enter a third developmental stage in which they begin to think for themselves. It is at this time that we begin to look beyond the beliefs of our family and to embrace the beliefs of our peers. Our faith now becomes an extension of our interpersonal relationships and the need to be acceptable and to fit in with the peer group, conforming to the judgment of this group. And those of us who have anything to do with teens know how strong that can be. And you know, my, my father used to say to my mother, you know, dear, um, they have a need to be different. He said, he's not being different, he's being like all the other bloody children. So, um, but we have a need to express our independence and our, our, our own authority. And it's at those times that we begin to, to question everything that we have ever been taught. What an important time for us to have access to our young people, eh? And to, and to give them a concept of God as we do in this teaching of being not a, a little white man up in the clouds or a little man of any color, but being a principle which is reliable and sure and on which they can pin their faith because it works as a law without fear or favor. By the fifth stage of our psycho-spiritual development, uh, we, we may have become familiar with the paradoxes that life holds. So we've moved out of 
teenagerhood. And as Fowler puts it, we are simultaneously alone and yet all one. If you think about that spelling of alone. We're able to discern powerful truths and at the same time appreciate their relativity. For example, the stories and myths in the Bible's description of our relationship with God reach us metaphorically through the language of spirit, and we feel more comfortable with the idea that every word need not be taken literally in order for us to pursue a meaningful spiritual practice. I find that this is the time when a lot of people say, I've been looking for a church home and find that their way here because they are beginning at this stage of spiritual development to say, I'm looking for something that has meaning for me personally and that has application to my life in the world and the life that I am living. Fowler says, there is still tension during this fifth stage of faith because we are caught between an untransformed world and a transforming vision. We're caught between an untransformed world and a transforming vision. You know, we say we have, we have a vision of a world that works for everyone. That is the, the center of spiritual living vision. And yet still we, we, we read of all of the stuff that's happening around the world and we're saying, you know, there is a huge gap between stated intention and achievement. And sometimes we get a bit disheartened and say, well, what's the point? You know, I've been praying and look, there's news of another uh, instance of man's inhumanity to man. But it's at this time that we are really called to rev up our faith and to dig our heels in and say, I know, I know the truth, and I will not be moved. I will stand on principle. Can we say that together? I know the truth, and I stand on principle. Together, I know the truth, and I stand on principle. If we can get past that, that stage of saying, well, when is it going to happen? And hold fast to the truth, as we say in our, our Declaration of Principles, that the goal is sure to be attained by all, and that we believe in a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature. When we do that, then we move into a stage of psycho-spiritual development known as universalizing faith. Universalizing faith, which Fowler considers to be relatively rare, but I disagree with him. I look out from this podium and I see it every Sunday when I speak up here. I see people who have reached that stage of knowing and knowing that they know. It is the faith of the Taoist farmer, as the story goes, who lived in China. And many of you know this story, but like all good teaching stories, it's worth repeating. The Taoist farmer had his plot of land and he had one horse. Remember that story? And that horse was really the tool for his livelihood. And one evening, feeling nature's urge to merge, the horse ran off in search of love. <laughs> and all of the villagers said, oh, vey. oh, this is terrible. Your one source for plowing, plowing the fields is gone. This is awful. Woe is you. What on earth will you do? And the farmer simply said, maybe. Next morning, the errant horse returned leading a whole, um, what, what you call, what's the collective noun? Herd of wild mustangs, and the villagers rushed to his farm and said, wow, aren't you lucky? Look at this, you're the richest man in the province. And he said, maybe. The next morning at dawn, the farmer's one son arose very early, and you know how our young people are, when they have an idea, they have to fulfill it immediately. So the son jumped up, chose one of the wild horses to break in, and, and mounted him. And of course, the horse promptly threw him and broke his leg. And all the villagers went there and said, oh, vey, how are you going to manage without the help of your one son? Boy, bad luck worse than Obia, as we say in Jamaica. And what did the farmer say? Maybe. Maybe. Next evening, the emperor's soldiers rode into the, the village, kicking up a cloud of dust. They had come to conscript all the able-bodied young men for war. And of course, the farmer's son, in Footbrook, could go nowhere. And all the villagers said, wow, aren't you lucky? And what did the farmer say? Maybe. Maybe. 
The story continues in the same fashion, my friends, through many other episodes, illustrating the importance of non-attachment to outcomes and its relationship to the development of our faith. You see, friends, when you have faith like the farmer, you know that everything is in divine order, whether you can see it immediately or not. This faith is based on the knowledge that the universe always conspires creatively for life to grow and to evolve as it should. So instead of labeling events good or bad, you simply let go, secure in the knowledge that all things always work together for greater good. And people who reach this stage of universalizing faith have the ability to perceive the larger whole that is greater than the sum of its parts, while at the same time possessing the simple trust of life which little children have. So we come full circle to being able to let go and to trust the universe. We need no longer be 34 and holding. We have another eminent Harvard graduate, and one closer to home, in the person of our own Douglas Arane. And he also speaks of the impact of our children of early, on early pay, of, of impact on our children of early parenting. In his just published book, The Business of Nation Building, he notes, and I quote, children are at the peak of their ability to absorb when they are at the preschool years, unquote. And he speaks also of the early advantage he gained by having both his parents intimately involved in his upbringing. In this highly readable book, this is a shameless commercial, <laughs> this highly readable book by Doug, he urges parents to devote more time and energy to participating more fully in the educational process involving their children, including closer guidance and counseling, greater involvement in PTAs, and cooperation with and support for teachers. The Business of Nation building, building is, in my view, a must read for all of us in New Thought, for it takes a positive approach to life without attempting to whitewash challenges. And Doug's grounding in the science of mind philosophy is apparent throughout it, as is the influence of his mother, who, before her passing, was blessed to see all of her children and her family become members of the Center for Spiritual Living. Let us applaud her. Very good, very good, very good. Yay, again, very good, very good, very good, yay. The book room has a few copies and Doug will be there to sign this morning and I've lent him my director's chair. I don't lend up my director's chair for any and every bo body, but this is uh, a really enlightened bottom that shall. Uh, 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 no, let me um, <laughs> let me rephrase this. Enlightened person that will occupy this chair. <laughs> so he'll be there to sign. <laughs> the beautiful Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 3, "We must become as little children." And Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, writes in the Science of Mind textbook, page 456, I quote, the life of the child is lived in natural goodness. God is natural goodness. We must return the way we came. As little children, we know that life is good and to be trusted. We are to approach our problems as though they were not, and approaching them in this manner, they will vanish. End of quote. So this brings me to your assignment. <laughs> Did I give you one already? <laughs> You're lucky. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, your further assignment, is to let go of all the cares and concerns and paradoxes of life and spend 20 minutes this week playing a child's game that you perhaps haven't done for years. Can you put your hands on the snakes and ladders or Chinese checkers or drafts that your children or grandchildren have abandoned? If not, or jacks, if you, can, if you have a set of jacks. If not, make up a game. Build a house using a deck of cards. Remember that? Balancing one on the other and trying to stop them from toppling. Or make a kite out of the ribs of palm fronds and tissue paper. Or here's a new one that's now all the rage. Print from your computer a picture to color, and spend an hour just coloring. <laughs> Adult coloring has become a favorite tool for creating calm. 
Try it. It's very, very, very relaxing. And you might even enjoy asking a few friends over and spend an afternoon coloring together. How about that? I'd like to close with a guided meditation um, inspired by Holmes's assertion that we must return the way we came. And so I'd like you to put all non-lap things out of your lap, as my beloved Sharon used to say. Make certain your phones are off. And take three deep, centering breaths. Breathe in peace. Breathe out all tension. Breathe in joy. Breathe out anything unlike joy. Breathe in love. And breathe out the love that you are, letting it fill this sanctuary. And now for a moment, just be aware of the sounds around you. Near sounds and far, soft sounds and loud. There may be the sound of your neighbor shuffling in the seat beside you, the whirring of fans, the sound of my voice, traffic on the street. Let all sounds around you make you more relaxed. And now become aware of the feel of your body on the chair. You are relaxed but alert. So just be aware of how your body feels. Note how your, where your hands are clasped in your lap or your ankles are crossed or your feet firmly on the ground, both of them. The pressure of your back on the back of your chair. Be aware of the familiar feel of your body and let that feeling make you more relaxed. In this relaxed state, I want you to imagine that you get into an elevator, a lift, on the 10th floor of a building, and you press B for basement. And as the elevator goes down, the little lights come on over the door, as you go down, you become more and more relaxed. And it stops with a little bump in the basement and the door is open. You find yourself in a long, narrow, dimly lit passage, at the end of which is a brightly colored door. You walk towards that door feeling absolutely at peace, absolutely calm, absolutely at one with all of life. And as you approach your brightly colored door, you begin to realize that behind that door, on the other side of it, is a period in your childhood that has significance for you as an adult today. And so as you get up to the door, there's a little step up, and there is a black garbage bag at the door. And before you, you, you put your hand on, the, on the, the door handle, I want you to stuff into that black garbage bag anything that no longer serves you in your life. Any fears, any anxieties, any illness, any residual anger at anyone or anything. Just put into that black garbage bag anything that you no longer want in your life and tie the mouth of it securely. And now you put your hand on the handle of your brightly colored door and it turns easily and swings open. 
and you find yourself in a yard and there is a little boy or a little girl playing in the yard. It is the little child within you. Notice what he or she is wearing. Notice how old he or she is. And you don't want to startle them. So you may want to hunker down, stoop, squat, so that your eyes are at eye level with them. And tell them hello. And tell him or her that you are from their future. And that you know the wonderful man or woman they will grow up to be. Tell him or her that you always loved him. And you will always be there with open arms. Say the words. Say, I love you to your little child. It may have been a long time since they have heard those magical words. I love and approve of you. You are in my heart forever. And you are safe. And your little child may whisper something in your ear. Ask you a question. Or tell you something that you need to know. Listen with your heart. And now ask them if they would like to come back to the f future with you. And if they say yes, press them into your heart. If they say no, promise to visit more often. And assure them that you're only a thought away. So it's time to take your leave. You make your way back to the brightly colored door. Stop and look back for a moment at that yard, the environment of your little child. And then you step through the door into the passageway and there at the bottom of the step up is the garbage bag. You can take back out of it anything you still need or you can leave it there for the garbage people to collect so that you are permanently rid of it. And you begin walking back up the passageway to the elevator feeling light, feeling joyful, feeling loved, knowing that you are a valid, valuable and authentic child of God. You get to the elevator, get in and press 10. And as the lights go on over the door, it brings you back up out of your journey within to the present moment. When the door is open on the 10th floor, take a deep, deep breath. And before opening your eyes, become aware again of the feel of the chair, and your body and its surroundings. Become aware again of the sounds around you, near sounds and far, soft sounds and loud.
Take another deep, deep breath. And when you're quite ready, ever so slowly, open your eyes. Come back to the present reality, feeling wonderful. Another deep breath and come back, open the eyes. Journalist Eileen Ratner, writing for WorldNetDaily.com, noted, and I quote, I have traveled the world over to know this one truth. There is no force of nature as powerful as the joy of a child. Children have the gift of being able to laugh and play through war, economic despair, natural disaster, disease, and hunger. Their magical power to transform their environment has been recorded for thousands of years. As Isaiah 11 verse 6 prophesied, a little child shall lead them. So let us affirm together, I let the little child within me lead me into pathways of love, laughter, and joy. I let the little child within me lead me into pathways of love, laughter, and joy. Turn to your neighbor and say, can the little child in you come out and play with me? Can the little child in you come out and play with me? Very good, very good, very good, yay! Very good, very good, very good, yay! Very good, very good, very good, yay! Namaste.